Ah, hello. It's nice to see you all here. Now, as the more perceptive of you probably realized by now, this is hell. And I am the devil. Good evening. Uh, but you can call me Toby, if you like. We, we try to keep things informal here, as well as infernal. Uh, um, that's just a little joke of mine. I tell it every time. Now, you're all here for eternity. Ooh. Which I hardly need tell you is a heck of a long time. Um, so you'll all get to know each other pretty well by the end. But for now, I'm going to have to split you up into groups. Will you stop screaming? Thank you. Now, murderers. Murderers, over here, please. Thank you. Uh, looters and pillagers, over here. Thieves, if you could join them. And lawyers, you're in that <laughs> Uh, fornicators, if you could step forward. My God, there are a lot of you. Uh, could I split you up into adulterers and the rest? Male adulterers, if you could just form a line in front of that small guillotine in the corner there. Uh, the French, are you here? If you'd just like to come down here with the Germans, that'd be like I'm sure you have plenty to talk about. Okay, um, atheists. Atheists, over here, please. You must be feeling a right bunch of nitwit. <laughs> oh. Never mind. And finally, Christians. Christians. Ah, yes, I'm sorry. I'm afraid the Jews were right. <laughs> be really kind. Thank you. Okay. Right. Well, are there any questions? Yes. No, I'm afraid we don't have any toilets. Um, if you'd read your Bible, you might have seen that it was damnation without relief. <laughs> so if you didn't go before you came, then I'm afraid you're not going to enjoy yourself very much. But, but then I believe that's the idea. Okay. Well, it's over to you, Adolf. And I'll uh, catch you all later at the barbecue. Bye. Well now, Mr. Perkins, it was good of you to come in. I realize that you're a busy man, but I didn't think this matter could be discussed over the electric telephone. No, no, absolutely, Headmaster. I mean, if Tommy's in some sort of trouble, then I'd like to nip it in the bud. Well, quite frankly, Tommy is in trouble. Recently, his behaviour has left a great deal to be desired. Oh, dear. He seems to take no interest in school life whatsoever. He refuses to muck in on the sports field. And it's weeks since any master has received any written work from him. Oh, dear me. Quite frankly, Mr. Perkins, if he wasn't dead, I'd have him expelled. <laughs> Beg your pardon? Yes, expelled. <laughs> if I wasn't making allowances for the fact that your son is dead, he'd be out on his ear. Oh, he's dead? Yes. He's lying up there in sick bay now. Stiff as a board and bright green. And this is, I fear, typical of his current attitude. <laughs> you see, the boy has no sense of moderation. One moment he's flying around like a paper kite, and the next moment he's completely immovable. And beginning to smell. <laughs> How did he die? Well, is that important? Well, yes, I think so. Well, 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 it's all got to do with the library, you see. We've had a lot of trouble recently with boys taking out library books without library cards. Your son was caught, and I administered a beating during which he died. But you'll be glad to know... 
You'll be glad to know that the ringleader was caught, so I don't think we'll be having any more trouble with library discipline. You see, the library card system... I, I'm sorry. Was, uh, you beat my son to death? Yes, yes, so it would seem. Please, I'm not used to being interrupted. You see, the library card system was introduced... Well, exactly, what happened? Well, apparently boys were just slipping in the library and taking the books. No, during the beating. Oh, that. Well, well, one moment he was bending over, the next moment he was lying down. I mean, uh... uh hmm, deadish. <laughs> Mr. Perkins, I find this morbid fascination of yours with your son's death quite disturbing. <laughs> what I'm talking about is his attitude. And quite frankly, I can see where he gets it from. Well, it wasn't me that beat him to death. Well, that was perfectly obvious to me from the first day he arrived here. I wondered then, as I wonder now, if he might not have turned out to be a very different boy indeed if you had administered a few fatal beatings earlier. on. Are you mad? Now I'm furious. In order to accommodate the funeral, I've had to cancel afternoon school on Wednesday. This is preposterous. Yes, it is. Or at least it would be, if it were true. What? I've been joking, Mr. Perkins. <laughs> Pardon me, it's my strange academic sense of humor. I've been pulling your leg. <laughs> oh, thank God. I wouldn't cancel afternoon school to bury that little shit. <laughs> On the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And it came to pass that all the wine was drunk. And the mother of Jesus said unto the Lord, They have no more wine. And Jesus said unto the servants, Fill six water pots with water. And they did so. And when the steward of the feast did taste of the water from the pots, it had become wine. And they knew not whence it had come. But the servants did know. And they applauded loudly in the kitchen. <laughs> and they said unto the Lord, How the hell did you do that? and inquired of him, do you do children's parties? <laughs> and the Lord said, no. <laughs> but the servants did press him, saying, go on, give us another one. <laughs> and so he brought forth a carrot and said, behold this, for it is a carrot. And all about him knew that it was so, for it was orange, with a green top. And he did place a large red cloth over the carrot, and then removed it. And lo, he held in his hand a white rabbit. And all were amazed and said, this guy is really good. He should turn professional. And they brought him on a stretcher, a man who was sick of the palsy. And they cried unto him, Maestro, this man is sick of the palsy. And the Lord said, if I had to spend my whole life on a stretcher, I'd be pretty sick of the palsy too. <laughs> and they were filled with joy and cried out, Lord, thy one-liners are as good as thy tricks. Thou art indeed an all-round family entertainer. <laughs> and there came unto him a woman called Mary, who had seen the Lord and believed. And Jesus said unto her, Put on a tutu, <laughs> and lie down in this box. And then took he forth a saw, and cleft her in twain. 
and there was much wailing and gnashing of teeth. But Jesus said, Oh, ye of little faith. And he threw open the box, and lo, Mary was whole. And the crowd went absolutely bananas. And Jesus and Mary took a big bow. And he said unto her, From now on you shall be known as Sharon. For that is a good name for an assistant. And the people said, We've never seen anything like this. This is great. You must be the Son of God. But the Lord said, No, I am he who comes before. And they were sore amazed and said, Then, Master, how shall we know the true Lord? And Jesus said, By his name shall ye know him. And he shall have a very religious name. And he shall be called Paul. And Daniel shall he be called. Paul Daniels, they cried. <laughs> and the Lord said, Yes, something like that. Here ends the lesson. And now, in the latest of our series, A Day in the Life, we present A Day in the Life of the Invisible Man. Every morning, I go to work by tube. Very soon, however, I get bored and decide to start annoying other passengers. I usually select the most respectable person I can find and blow gently into his left ear. <laughs> then into his right ear. <laughs> then perhaps down the back of his neck. It's about this time that the man thinks I am a draft. But not for long, because I soon stick two fingers up his nose. <laughs> higher and higher, uh, removing them just before he sneezes. <laughs> then, I start to manipulate some other limbs. leave him alone for about 10 seconds <laughs> and when he is at his most vulnerable I kick him in the groin ah! <laughs> and steal his seat Welcome back to the Olivier Theatre Awards and we come now to the award for Best Actor of the Year and the nominations this year are Al Pacino for Death of a Salesman, Kenneth Branagh for Richard III and then two actors, both from the same remarkable new play, Stench by Harold Barkworthy. <laughs> And the nominees are John Daniels in the role of Mr. Trotter and David Forbert in the role of Mr. Gannett. Now, these are four fine actors, and I'm sure they'd all agree that the point is not to win, but to play the game. And the winner is... John Daniels! No oh, shit! <laughs> Unfortunately, John is unable to be with us tonight, and so I'd like to ask his co-star, David Forbert, to accept the award on his behalf. David. Uh, David. David, um, 
Perhaps you'd like to say a few words, David. Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what a delight it is to accept this award on behalf of my close personal acquaintance, <laughs> John Daniels. John cannot unfortunately accept it himself because he is in Hollywood, starring in his first major film role with Meryl Streep. I am, however, not in Hollywood. <laughs> not having been offered even a minor role in an eight-millimeter pornographic movie. <laughs> but what a delightful object it is that John has won. Although, you know, I'm sure I will very soon receive one myself when I next buy ten gallons of petrol at a Texaco <laughs> So what is it that Johnny has got that makes him stand apart from other actors of his generation? Well, I think we all know the answer to that one. Syphilis. <laughs> and what a great and heartwarming thing it is that he has already started passing it on to a whole new generation of younger actors. Of course, to win an acting award is always a great honour, but to receive one here in the heart of London's famous West End on an occasion such as this hugely diminishes that honour. <laughs> what could be more dull than these sordid, back-slapping sessions where has-beens in tuxedos hand over to even older has-beens in tuxedos awards for plays that closed the week before they opened because the audiences were clamouring instead for tickets to Andrew Lloyd Webber's latest rearrangement of a Vita to suit the vocal range of Kylie Minogue. Therefore, cannot say what a delight it is that John has won this award instead of me. And I should like to announce my retirement from the acting profession in order to begin a lifetime of work amongst the mentally handicapped. <laughs> in which capacity I look forward to meeting all the members of the judging panel very soon. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the Boston University Huntington Theatre for this, the second part of our course in elementary courting for men. May I say how pleased I am with tonight's turnout? Some 800 people, which is very gratifying. Tonight we look at the first date. Obviously taking out a girl for the first time is a very complex issue. The first crucial step is having arranged to pick up your date, not to look like a complete idiot when she opens the door. best to look as though your attention has been momentarily distracted. <laughs> but when you do notice her, it is vital to say how pretty she is looking straight away. But don't overdo it. <laughs> if at this point you are introduced to her parents, attitude is all important. You can be too casual, You can be too keen. Uh, when you've said goodbye to the parents, uh, again, don't overdo it. Lead her to your car. And remember to open the door. Uh, once in the car, there are various ways of driving. If you drive like this... <laughs> you... You might lose her respect. If you drive like this... You should have taken a taxi. Before long, you'll arrive at the restaurant. Get out of the car. And 
and escort her to your table. Then tuck her into her seat, yourself. And attract the waiter's attention. from the wine list is important. Complete ignorance is not good. <laughs> when the bottle arrives, there's much to be made in the tasting of it, but don't be too professional. Again, moderation is the order of the day. Don't eat too fast. <laughs> but don't eat too slowly. <laughs> Next is receiving the bill. This is a very important moment. You must be sure not to lose your cool. This is right. This is wrong. course offer to pay herself, in which case you should refuse for a while. <laughs> Next stop is a fashionable discotheque. <coughs> Once inside, you might look slightly strange if you try and talk over the music, so just stand casually and look sexy. <laughs> this is good. This is better. This is starting to be misguided. After stance, dance technique is most important. Most people don't know how to dance, and so do too much. Other people do too little. Some people dance as if there's something up their bottom. People dance as if there's something coming out of their bottom. <laughs> when all said and done, it's best probably not to dance at all. The well-mimed sporting injury is always useful, and a good excuse for leaving the discotheque. If you don't utterly foul it up, 20 minutes later, you should be back at your place. It's important to relax and make your guest feel at home. She will probably feel as nervous as you do, and there's no need to make any extra special effort. <laughs> then, putting on the music. We can't help you with the choice of CD, even though, no matter what the circumstances, Donnie and Marie Osmond's greatest hits would be a mistake. <laughs> costs, avoid the temptation to brag about your stereo. <laughs> now comes the moment you've been waiting for. The seduction. This is the subject of next week's lecture. <laughs> However, as a rough guide, this is right. And this is, I think you'll agree, disastrous. <laughs> oh, uh, good evening, gentlemen. 
No, 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 that's no problem. Come in, please. Although, sh- although, perhaps if we could just keep that delightful singing down a little bit. Oh, dear. Obviously, plenty of refreshment at the football game. No, no, come in, do. Oh, no, 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 that table is reserved. Um, it is also a table for two people. Uh, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps this table might be more suitable for nine. <laughs> If you'd like to step this way, gentlemen, please. Oh, dear. Here, let me help you up, sir. Uh, no, no, it is a tricky bit of floor, that. Uh, d- deceptively flat and unimpeded. If you'd like to take a seat, uh, yes. Or perhaps on the chair. <laughs> and th- there we are. Right, right. Now, what would anybody... Quiet, uh, sh- sh- quiet, quiet, gentlemen, please, quiet. What would anybody like to drink? <laughs> Nine pints of lager. <laughs> Eighteen pints of lager. <laughs> Eighteen pints of lager, right? He doesn't keep it up. <laughs> now, if you'd just like to take a menu, they'll just pass those round there and one for you, sir. Oh, dear. There we go. Straight onto the floor. Here, let me pick it up for you. Oh, and again, I tell you what, try and grip it, sir. <laughs> Either side, between the thumb and the four fingers. If you grip, it won't always fall on the floor. I tell you what, why don't we just put it on the table? Here, let me rest it against your friend's head. There we are. There, that should be fine. Right, now, what would anybody like to eat? Um, oh, uh, it is a lamb dish, sir. Uh, yes, a marinated lamb in coconut with a cream sauce. Very nice. No, not f***ing hot, sir. Um, it is a... Uh, how can I put it? It is a... Um, it is a medium-spiced dish. Yes. Oh, oh, well, in that case... No, in that case, you want the Bombay duck. <laughs> No, no, duck. <laughs> no, no, duck. D- duck. With the duck. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, it was your little joke. <laughs> uh, very funny. <laughs> well done. Well done, everybody, on that one. Uh, that was very good. Um, uh, no, no, it is the chic kebab uh, that is like two little turds. Um... <laughs> Uh, the shami kebab is a sort of a mince on- onion rissol. A bit like cow dung, sir, yes, but in smaller portions. In fact. Ah, Raji, thank you, if you'd like to put the drinks down. Uh, well, can we move your friend here? Well, well, perhaps if we just roll him. That's a good idea. Perhaps if we just roll him out of his cutlery and into the mango chutney. Don't worry, he'll be fine there. Thank you, Raji. Hmm. Now... Would anybody like any writer? That's a kind of uh, a, a yogurt dip, sort of onion cucumber. Yes, look, I think we'd better uh, wake up your friend here. Well, no, he is not just having a little nap. He's having a little nap face down in a pitcher of beer. <laughs> he is going to drown. <laughs> uh, well, but, oh, dear. No, no, don't worry, sir. Much better out than in. Eh? <laughs> don't you worry about it. Don't you worry about a thing. Uh, just leaves all the more room for your chicken curry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, do you know what your friend here might like to eat? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> what would you like to eat? A hot dog. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> so let me just go back on this, please. We want a cucumber writer, an onion writer... A paperback writer. <laughs> but I'm presuming that's a joke. Uh, four meat curry, one Bombay duck, four rice, four shami kebab, and a hot dog. And anything else for starters? Just some poppadoms and salad and yogurt and shit. Okay, I'll, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Although I'm not sure you'll be needing that last item. <laughs> As you all seem quite full enough of shit already. <laughs> Rajiv! Rajiv, come on!
Jo, var det kanske roligt bär. Var har jag av arm i? Men han har det. Men vill jag kom, du brukar dock aldrig där. Det är dem. Det är hoppen och sen nog har det väl väl är en risk att jag bär. Och jag vill vara med den där av en man. Men det var att låta Ja. Han kommer til å smakke på det. Blæ! Du er bare vel hånd. Blæ! Han er vel vel hånd. Det er ikke noe kjærlig. Det er jo det jeg får den. Og det er ikke noe som bare har blitt kjærlig. Det er ikke noe som bare har blitt kjærlig. Det er ikke noe som bare har blitt kjærlig. Det er ikke noe som bare har blitt kjærlig. Yeah, on the hip. 
Ja, men, 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 when everything seems to go wrong. I did. Unfortunately, it was my wedding day, and three men in particular were to blame. It all started with the priest. I now pronounce you man and wife. Well done. You may now kiss the bride. <laughs> nice one. All right, please be seated, everybody. I'd just like to say a few words before communion. You know, a lot of prospective brides ask me these days, Father, what is the church's attitude to fellatio? <laughs> and I tend to reply by telling them a little story about the first time I was asked that question. <laughs> it was a couple of years ago now, and a, and a young, attractive bride-to-be came up to me after a service and asked me just that question. Father, what is the church's attitude to fellatio? And I replied, well, you know, Joanne, I'd like to tell you, but unfortunately, I don't know what fellatio is. <laughs> and so she showed me. <laughs> and ever since, whenever anyone has asked me the question, Father, what is the church's attitude to fellatio? I always reply, well, you know, I'd like to tell you. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't know what fellatio is. <laughs> Next came my trusted best man. Um, oh, right, right. Uh, right, well, uh, right. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow survivors of that stunning stag party, how did those two girls get under the table, and what the hell were they up to with that toothpaste? Uh, all right, well, um, well, uh, just before I left the house um, this afternoon, uh, I said to myself, you know, the last thing you must do is forget your speech. Um, and so, sure enough, when, um, when, when I left the house, ooh, <laughs> um, uh, the last thing I did, <laughs> yes, you've guessed it, was to forget my speech. So, um, so it's all ad lib, I'm afraid. Uh, um, uh, 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 Well, uh, well, uh, well, now, 
now, where should I begin? Um, I'd like to begin now. Uh, uh, right, well, 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 I've known the groom ever since we first went to school together at the age of eight. And you know, he hasn't changed a bit. Uh, well, that's not quite true, of course. He didn't have his beard then. <laughs> um, um, and I tell you this, he wouldn't have been able to do whatever he was doing last night with those two extraordinary, <laughs> extraordinary... Um, extraordinary how little people change, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, although I know I've changed a great deal because I used to be an absolute arse. <laughs> blurting things out when I shouldn't. Uh, uh, for instance, this afternoon, I'm sure I wouldn't have been able to resist mentioning the bizarre sight that greeted my eyes when I opened this man's bedroom door earlier this morning. Um, yes, but, uh, but, uh, but enough of that. Uh, he started making gestures at me now, which I think uh, means he wants me to cut my speech short. Um, so suffice to say that I think he'll make a ripping husband, uh, and I think his wife's ripping too, <laughs> and I can only hope that, that the dress will hold out. Uh, um, so I'd like to propose a toast um, to go with the pate. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, to the groom and to his lovely horse, uh, wife. Uh, it's, all, it's all starting to come back to me now. <laughs> um, and I just know that their marriage will be as happy and satisfied as I was when I paid off those two prostitutes earlier this morning. <laughs> And finally, my loving father-in-law provided the perfect end to a perfect day. Mm. Uh, ladies and gentlemen and friends of my daughter. <laughs> there comes a time in every wedding reception when the man who paid for the damn thing is allowed to speak a word or two of his own. And I should like to take this opportunity, sloshed as I may be, <laughs> to say a word or two about Martin. As far as I'm concerned, my daughter could not have chosen a more delightful, charming, Witty, responsible, wealthy, let's not deny it. Well-placed, good-looking, and fertile young man <laughs> than Martin as her husband. And I therefore ask the question, why the hell did she marry Gerald instead? <laughs> Because Gerald is the sort of man we used to describe at school as a complete prick. <laughs> if I may use a gardening simile here, if his entire family may be likened to a compost heap, and I think they can, then Gerald is the biggest weed growing out of it. I think he's the sort of man people emigrate to avoid. <laughs> I remember the first time I met Gerald, I said to my wife, she's the lovely woman propping up that horrendous old lush of a mother of his, either this man is suffering from serious brain damage or the new vacuum cleaners arrive. <laughs> As for his family, they are quite simply the most intolerable herd of steaming social animals I've ever had the misfortune of turning my nose up to. I spurn you as I would spurn a rabid dog. I would like to propose a toast to the caterers. to the pigeon who crapped on the groom's family's limousine at the church. Um, 
As for the rest of you around this table, not directly related to me, you can sod off. I wouldn't trust any of you to sit the right way on a toilet seat. Good morning, everyone. Settle down now, please. Uh, now, as you may know, uh, we were hoping to have Mr. Jeremy Irons with us this morning, talking to us about the art of acting in the cinema. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Irons has had to cancel due to an unforeseen awards ceremony. Um, but uh, I have been able to procure the services of a local actor, Mr. Uh, Bernard Hupper, who was uh, luckily uh, not busy. So uh, it's my pleasure now to read for Mr. Hupper. Uh, as he illustrates his own lecture on Shakespearean acting, entitled, The Actor's Art. The Actor's Art by Bernard Hupper. <laughs> At the centre of the Elizabethan world sits the king. Upon the character of the king depends the plot, and so there are many different kinds of king. The benign king. The benign king with a physical defect. <laughs> The Mad King. The Evil King. The Evil King hatching a plot. The Mad King hatching an egg. An important part was also played by messengers, distinguishable into many different types. A messenger enters bearing good news. A messenger enters bearing bad news. Messenger enters bearing indifferent news. Enters bearing bad news, which he thinks is good news. <laughs> Death came swift and often in this brutal world. Death could come at the hands of a total stranger. <laughs> or it could come at the hands of one's closest friend. Poison was particularly popular, applied to the frothing cup of ale of the unsuspecting victim. First we look at the simple poisoning kill. <laughs> 
And then the villain attempting to use poison. But in the end, all these were merely devices, amounting to nothing whatsoever without the plot. At the centre of the plot stands the hero, who is king. He has a twin brother. Who is a villain. With a physical defect. War comes, and the hero must lead his men into battle. At the gates, the hero's mistress waits to bid her lover farewell. <laughs> and the villain's mistress bids her lover farewell also. The war rages on for many years. Until, at last, a messenger arrives bearing the bad news of the death of the hero. So the villain becomes king. But the message was wrong. And years later, the hero returns. In disguise. Revealing his identity to the audience by means of a surreptitious wink. <laughs> but his brother, the villain, recognises him. And they fight. <laughs> Finally, the villain is mortally wounded. He dies. his rightful throne and celebrates with a frothing cup of ale found by the side of his brother's throne. Ashes to ashes. Amen. We are gathered here today on this beautiful autumn morning to pay our last respects to Thomas Fairclough, Richard Mason and Harold Walker. Tom, Dick and Harry. As they were known to all of us. Three stout fellows of our community who will be sorely missed. Tom, sadly, was blind, an affliction he bore with great fortitude, especially considering he was also deaf. His only power was that of speech and song, and we all recall his enormous voice joining lustily in our hymn singing. Of course, being blind and deaf Tom never actually knew what hymn we were singing. Which seemed appropriate. Because we never knew what hymn he was singing either. In fact, if we had to be frank with each other, Tom didn't actually know any hymns. Thus it is with deep gratitude we recall the day when Colonel Grant, using only a sense of touch through the medium of a clenched fist, actually broke through to Tom and got him to shut up. 
Needing guidance through the darkness of life, Tom was lucky to have a friend like Dick. Dick had perfect eyesight and would gladly lead Tom wherever he wanted to go. Unfortunately, since Dick was also deaf, he couldn't actually hear where Tom wanted to go. Yet like Tom, Dick never complained about his afflictions, did he? Well, he couldn't. He was dumb. <laughs> but blessed with the gift of vision, though stone deaf, he was a tremendous fan of Olivia Newton-John. <laughs> Being such an idiosyncratic pair, deaf to the world about them, Tom and Dick were to have the permanent companionship of Harry. Harry could literally hear a pin drop. Although, being blind and dumb, he could not see to pick it up or warn anyone else not to stand on it. And so, as individuals, they were sadly afflicted. But together, they were in possession of all of God's senses, weren't they? And it is together that we remember them together at their job, checking eggs at the battery farm. <laughs> Dick would look for the cracks, Tom would complain to the foreman, and Harry would do the listening to Radio One. <laughs> Likewise, in the evening, when they had returned from work, they would all sit on the big red couch, Dick watching the television, Harry listening to the television, and Tom insisting that it was time to buy a television. <laughs> Sadly, as we all know, three days ago their peaceful lives were ended. Dick saw the combine harvester. Harry heard the combine harvester, but neither could cry out. Tom, who could have cried out, never had the faintest idea what hit him. <laughs> And so they were all harvested together, blended into oneness at last, and now we trust are in heaven, as happy as any in that immortal host. For Dick will see the angels' choir, Harry will hear the angels' choir, and no doubt Tom will ruin it for everybody. <laughs> Come on, settle down, please. <laughs> Answer your names. Anus. <laughs> Ass bandit. <laughs> Bottom. <laughs> Clitoris. Where are you, Clitoris? <laughs> Doo doo. <laughs> Enema. <laughs> Fist up. <laughs> Come on, grow up, please. <laughs> Genital. <laughs> I'm sorry. Genital. <laughs> Herpes. <laughs> Still with us, I see. <laughs> I'm a dick. <laughs> I'm a dick. Enema, you know I'm a dick, don't you? <laughs> Jaculation. <laughs> my prick. <laughs> Has anybody seen my prick? <laughs> Come on, somebody must have seen my prick. <laughs> Very well, remind me to beat my prick when he does that. <laughs> 
nice and quick. <laughs> On top. Pube. Ah, my prick. So good of you to turn up. <laughs> yes, well, now that you are here, my prick, perhaps you'd like to find a seat. Bottom squeeze my prick in somewhere, though. <laughs> Rigid. <laughs> Our Russian exchange student, suck me off. <laughs> Tight fit. <laughs> up your sh. Vulva. Your prick. And zipper. Zipper. Absent. Now then, boys, the headmaster has asked me to speak to you this morning on the subject of smut. <laughs> All members of staff have noticed an alarming increase in the use of silly humour and puerile innuendo about the school. Rigid fist up, bottom out. <laughs> There have been some disgusting doodlings on the walls of the lavatory. Sit up straight on top. <laughs> One or two unpleasant health magazines have been found. If you fall asleep on top, I shall be very annoyed. <laughs> and Mr. Hardon tells me that there's been a great deal of sniggering in his biology class. Tight fit, for heaven's sake, leave your prick alone. <laughs> I don't care, your prick had no business poking into your desk in the first place. I will not put up with this kind of behaviour, boys. And neither, I must warn you, will Mr. Gritbig Hartcock. <laughs> this is a school for the sons of gentlemen, and the theory is that one day you will turn into gentlemen yourselves. That is, with the exception of genital, who appears to be turning into a ferret. <laughs> so, there will be an end to this second-form toilet humour, where so much conversation is just devoted to smutty, doublon tendre, do-do, suck-me-off, nice-and-quick, detention Saturday. <laughs> Right, I'm going to the staff room now, but if I come back and catch herpes in the corridor like the headmaster did yesterday, <laughs> then there'll be trouble.